All right, so we're going to shift a little bit and get into talking about regulations. So you already covered some of the basics. You know everything about the economy itself. Let's talk about how to screw up the economy. Okay? So first things first, though, if you don't already, follow me on Twitter. That's the important part of the lecture. So how can we study uh, regulations? Well, the common way would be to study statistically, look at empirical data, uh, and try to figure out, okay, did this cause a, a problem or did it make things better, right? So we can capture actual mag magnitudes. So we can just look at, say, the unemployment rate. We can look at the average wage for people after, say, we have uh, increased the minimum wage. Let's see, how does wages, do wages go up or do they not? That sort of thing. Of course, with data, we know that data is history. Data only tell us what happened at that point in time, and they only tell us about that specific situation. The other way to do it, of course, is theoretically, as we prefer as Austrians, because theoretically we can be very specific and we can tell, some, tell what would happen universally, and that would, would always be true, right? The problem with theory, though, is that it doesn't tell us anything about magnitudes. So we can't say beforehand that, oh, this minimum wage is going to increase wages by this much overall. We also cannot say, say that unemployment is going to have an effect on this many people, or this many jobs will be created or destroyed or, or forgotten or whatever. Right? We can't really get, get to this data because th that's specific for the situation. On the other hand, theoretically, we can look at what will happen versus what could otherwise happen. So we can have a, a, the economic trade-off, right? Look at either this or that, the counterfactual. And of course, theory will help us uh, look into the future and see what will be the case. So if we look at what mainstream economists do when they study regulations, they, of course, they have this um, fetish for data and empirical uh, analyses. Uh, so what they do is they, they compare and try to figure out, <clears throat> excuse me, the social cost and the social benefit and the economy overall, and they look at the statistics, and of course they tamper with the statistics a little bit uh, to make sure that it fits the models uh, and things like that. So they sort of hypothesize that, oh, this is what it will look like, or if they look at historical data, they say, oh, this is what happened, of course that's the statistics, and then they calculate this is what would have happened without this regulation or without this support or what have you, okay? Um, the problem here is, of course, that you can't really be forward-looking and you don't have data about this alternative world. So if you, in, if you implement a regulation, how do you know what otherwise would have happened? Well, there are some statistical um, tools you can use such as synthetic controls is one of those ways, which basically means that you create a statistical entity that is or looks like what you're actually studying. So if you raise the minimum wage in Texas, say, maybe you can take the, the relevant variables from other states and combine them in a certain way with weights so that they historically look just like Texas. And then you assume that, oh, they will in the future behave just like Texas too. And then you enforce this regulation in Texas and real Texas with regulation and then the synthetic Texas without regulation and you can compare the two. Obviously there are some assumptions involved, right? A lot of guesswork. But what they're tr really trying to capture, of course, is the seen and the unseen, right? Because the seen is obvious, that's in the statistics. The unseen is not seen, obviously, and it's also not captured in any statistics. But what is missing? Well, what is missing is the long-term effects. And we, unfortunately, we tend to miss those also in Austrian economics sometimes. They also don't have a proper economic theory. Some of them might not like me pointing that out, but that's, that's true. And they have no clue how entrepreneurs make money because there are no entrepreneurs. Whereas I tell my students at the beginning of an entrepreneurship course, I put the economy on the board supply and demand, right? And I tell them, here, here's the marker. Please point out where is the entrepreneur. Well, where can you put the entrepreneur in a, an equilibrium 
system. There is none, right? So obviously entrepreneurs are not in the picture, but we need entrepreneurship to understand what are the impacts of regulations and where is the economy heading? How is the economy a, a process? All of these things, right? Without an, a change agent, how can there be change? There is not. So of course, the mainstream view of the economy is just a static system where nothing really happens. There's not even action because we're in equilibrium already. So for a proper economic theory, and this old gentleman approves, we need to recognize that value is subjective, that the market is a process, and it's not the economics uh, gang sign. Um, entrepreneurship is at the very core. Entrepreneurship is sort of the creative force in the economy. And we need to understand economic calculation. Because without economic calculation, when you heard uh, Dr. Salerno the first day of Mrs. U, economic calculation, it, well, to put it in technical terms, it's the shit. OK, so how do we then study regulations theoretically? What does it mean? And what can we learn about regulations using economic theory, proper, sound, Austrian economic theory? Well, if we, we must first define what is a regulation at all, what does it mean when we enforce or implement a regulation? Well. After that, how does it affect human action? Because human action, as you know, is at the very core of what makes the economy. So first we need to know what is it, what is the regulation, how does that affect the, um, the action of people, and what about people's value scales? And you've learned about that too, you know what, what those are, right? And then we can start talking about what are the short-term and long-term impacts of regulations on the economy? Because it's not that obvious. And statistics don't really tell us a whole lot about people's actions or their value scales or anything like that, right? So then we can start talking about, okay, so what is the effect on entrepreneurship, on production, on economic calculation? Questions that mainstream economists don't even ask, ask right? And why don't you ask a question that is obvious? Because you don't have any answers. Okay, so what I'm going to do is talk about regulations sort of contrast them with other forms of destruction because you you might have the, the the idea that regulations destroy things that's not actually true so I'm going to contrast regulations and their impact on the economy with actual destruction and you'll, you'll see that destruction is no biggie okay so let's take an example let's assume that there is a city in in Germany somewhere called Dresden Let's assume that someone drops a lot of bombs over the city. <laughs> Purely hypothetical. Now, there's a miracle, sort of. So these bombs, they destroy a whole lot of things, basically everything, but no one is really harmed. So let's get personal harm and death and such, such things out of the way. But the city is just flattened. People's homes, people's cars, machines, factories, all these things, they're gone. OK, so what happens? The next day, say the bombing is over. It was just an afternoon bombing, so it so wasn't a big thing, really. <laughs> what happens? Well, everybody's without a home. So what are they going to do? Do you think they would work harder or just as hard as before when they find themselves without a home? Harder, right? They would put in a lot of effort trying to rebuild their homes because well, we sort of like having a home and a shelter, somewhere to live, right? So if people get really busy, they probably sacrifice a lot of leisure time in order to just rebuild their homes, right? So they've changed their value scales um, and building a home, recreating those buildings is very at the very top, and we'll get to that. This is what Paul Krugman would call economic growth, right? Because there's a lot of activity, a lot of creation, and everybody's rebuilding their home. Economic growth is awesome. Lots of jobs, right? No one with a home, doesn't matter, but lots of jobs, lots of stuff going on. Of course, after they have finished rebuilding, where are they at? Well, exactly where they started just before the bombing. So much for economic growth, right? But Paul Krugman's world, it is economic growth. 
Okay, so what happens then in Dresden, this hypothetical city? Well, when they start building all these houses and all these, these buildings everywhere, of course they're going to have to buy materials and buy tools and whatever else you have, which means that the demand in Dresden increases like crazy because they're going to buy everything all, all, all over Germany, basically, but especially close to Dresden. They're going to bid up prices. So a lot of these materials that were used in neighboring cities, in maybe faraway cities as well, will be reallocated to Dresden because they would be willing and probably able to pay a whole lot more for them. Of course, this is nothing strange, right? If you were without a home, you would be willing to pay quite a bit for some wood and so forth to rebuild your home, right? So resources will be shifted into Dresden. Probably some businesses will increase their production as well. People will work longer hours just to produce the materials so that they, these people can rebuild their homes. That's pretty obvious stuff, right? So I hope no one is uh, surprised by this analysis. Might, there might be disaster relief and so forth as well. Maybe, if you're lucky, even the government will do something, uh, something uh, productive, that is. But the thing is, with destruction, yeah, it's a setback. But everybody is still pursuing their highest valued ends, which in this case is the lost buildings, their lost homes. Right? They're trying to recreate them. OK, so what do we have then? With destruction, in this case a bombing, that's definitely destructive, we have a temporary loss, a setback. Right? Everybody lost their homes. We didn't lose anything else. We just lost our homes. So we lost the wealth that we had. But well, and, and, and the, our increased demand for rebuilding these homes, because that's highest on our list, right? Uh, bids up prices for the, all the materials. It also means that all the resources are put to their most highly valued ends, right? Because these people are really desperate for housing. So, of course, resources will shift to where the higher prices are, which is for these people to get houses again. No, no, no strange, nothing strange about that analysis, right? And, of course, for people in general, that means that their value scales are perhaps intact. They lost uh, this, this end that they were already satisfying, a uh, home, a shelter. But now they can continue in their actions and just pursue their highest valued, still unsatisfied end. It's a different end, but in terms of value scales, it's the same thing, right? So it's a temporary shock. This follows by um, still acting in the same way. Action is still the same. They're still trying to achieve that highest valued end that is, remains unsatisfied. Does it make sense? So the structure of action is the same. There's nothing strange going on, really. So how are regulations different from this? How many of you would say that bombing a city might be worse than regulation? Raise your hands. Are you really Austrians? <laughs> OK, so let's look at how regulations are different. Of course, I didn't bombing a city and minor regulation. You might think that regulations aren't that bad. But let me sh show you how, from an Austrian perspective, it's really terrible. OK, so a regulation is really a restriction imposed on action. So it just says that you cannot do this, or you cannot use this means, and you cannot pursue this end, whatever it is. Right, so it's a restriction that is imposed on you. It's nothing you choose yourself. And it's necessarily a restriction that takes that option away from you. Why? Because what is a regulation that doesn't affect you? It's ineffective. It doesn't cause any change whatsoever. The point of a regulation, of course, is to affect change. It's intended to change the world which means it has to affect you in some way, right? It has to affect someone. It's like setting the minimum wage at uh, negative $2. Is it an effective regulation? No, unless someone wants to, uh, wants to work for negative $3. But not a whole lot of people want to do that, right? 
But if you set the minimum wage at $100 an hour, it's going to be very effective because a lot of people make less than $100 an hour. Right? I'm not saying it's necessarily efficient or that it's good or anything like that. I'm just saying it's an effective regulation in the sense that it causes change. Right? It has an effect. OK, so it is really a prohibition on certain types of actions or a ban on those types of actions. OK? For it to be effective, it has to be a ban on such actions that are possible. So if I tell you that from tomorrow, uh, the Brandon administration uh, is banning hovering in the air, well, OK, you wouldn't be able to do that anyway, so it doesn't matter. Right? For it to be effective, it has to be something that you could potentially do. Right? So as I put it here, uh, they have to pro prohibit actions that are physically and economically and formally feasible. That's what makes uh, regulation effective. Right? What I'll show you now is that this is not destruction. Right? It doesn't destroy anything, which is why a lot of politicians prefer regulations. But it's destructive in a sense. OK, so let's look at an example. So let's go back in time to 2000, 2006, beautiful year that most of you probably don't uh, remember at all. But let's assume that there's this government agency, hypothetical, called the CDC, and that they're doing great work uh, saving us from a virus. There's some disease that is spread, and they think it's because you touch surfaces. So they outlaw touch screens. That's a regulation, right? And Beck, believe it or not, but in 2006, there were touch screens. OK, so here is uh, Dr. Anthony iPad Fauci. <laughs> so he is the main regulator in, in this case, OK? So let's do a value scale analysis of what happens in, in this case here, OK? So there were no iPads, of course, back in those days. But there was this new thing where you could, could have 1,000 songs in your pocket. Doesn't sound all that revolutionary, I know, not today. But back then, it was huge, because most of us were used to using Walkmans and things like that. And Walkman is, never mind. <laughs> um, but you could also have a portable radio, and you know what radio is, right? It's like Spotify in the airwaves. <laughs> OK, so without a regulation, people would start to buy these iPods. Right, these music players. Oh, in this case, the iPod Touch, because it was the second, next generation sort of iPod where you could actually have it, you had a touch screen and you could, you could scroll songs and, and things like that. Right? So without regulation, Apple would produce the iPod, the iPod Touch. And for whoever has the iPod Touch at the high, high end of their value scale, and it sort of outcompetes, it provides them or they expect to get higher value out of the iPod Touch than from a Walkman. And a Walkman is also higher value than they would get from a portable radio. With regulation, of course, there can be no iPod Touch because it's we're banned touch screens. So you would have to choose the Walkman instead. OK? So it will affect whoever wanted to get an iPod Touch, which is also the point, right? That's why you regulated this. You didn't want anyone to have a touch screen. OK, already we can see a difference from destruction. Because this is not really anymore a one-time loss, like bombing of hypothetical city Dresden. That happened once, and then people started rebuilding. No, this is every time that you wanted to enjoy music, you can't have an iPod Touch. Right? Every time, every time you go to the store to buy a Walkman or a portable radio or something like that, you probably wanted to have picked up instead an iPod Touch. The same thing every time you used your Walkman that you bought instead, you're like, oh man, if this had been an iPod Touch instead. Right? So it's less value every time you use it, every day, every, day, every time you commute or whatever it is. Okay? So the option to choose that is gone because of regulation. Okay? Now, it also means, of course, that whoever would, if you already bought one before the ban, if you break it, you can't replace it because they're not allowed to sell and produce them. 
Um, if you wanted to get a next generation, well, that's not going to be produced, so that's not an option either. Okay, so those values are also gone. Um, every day, every time, you're re basically reminded of this, right? So until you change your value scale, you will have a loss over and over again. And this loss between the iPod Touch and the Walkman, okay? And of course, you can't rebuild it as, it, as with Dresden. Okay, so this is also a process, right? It's, there's more going on than simply having consumer goods available in Best Buy or whatever. There's also a production side. So what we talked about with value scales, that's consumers. So on the, cons on the producer side, producers are not available and, and they're not allowed to produce uh, touch screens. So obviously what will they do? Something else. So they will shift their efforts and their investments to do something else. So whoever had a, a factory for producing touch screens, well, change whatever needs to be changed in that factory to produce something else. Or they might just sell it to get rid of it, and maybe there's like scrap value or someone finds another use for it, but it's a lower value use, right? Well, what that means from a consumer point of view, of course, is that there's an underproduction of touch screens. But since we're shifting these investments elsewhere in the economy, we get overproduction of those things. Because we would net, not get production of those things if we could produce the iPod Touch. Because the iPod Touch is the higher value, or at least entrepreneurs think so, right? So we get underproduction of the, the iPod Touch and anything touch screenish, and we get more overproduction of other things wherever those, uh, th those capital is reallocated to. Okay? Well, this is malinvestment, right? The whole production apparatus is distorted depending on, of course, where, where all these resources end up. But we have underinvestment here and overinvestment here. This is already out of whack with uh, consumers' actual wants because right? entrepreneurs can't pr pursue them. It's that easy. Okay, so, so far you're wondering what the heck is this guy talking about? Because nothing new, really, just maybe a little bit different terminology, li different words used, but obvious stuff for Austrians. So why does the Mises Institute give this guy time? That's what you're thinking. I can see it. OK, so what we have, just to summarize, let's spend some more time, regulations distort the production structure as we saw, right? Under and over investments in different things that are not actually aligned with consumer wants. Regulations cost losses because those options that would have been there, the higher valued options, in this case the iPod Touch, it's not going to be there. So we lose that value and whatever difference there is between the iPod Touch and the Walkman. Is there more? Yeah, there is more. The problem here is that what we haven't considered is that the market is a process. There's much more to this, right? And it's not only a process in the sense that, oh yeah, it's always adjusting a little bit. No, it's a process in terms of being cumulative, right? We talk about capital um, being accumulated over time and we're investing in more capital and, and we're saving and therefore we can have more capital. Well, the specificity of capital is changing too, right? Because we're investing in these these machines over here, and then we figure out a way to make a better machine based off of the knowledge that we got from using this machine, right? So we're learning and we're adding to the capital structure based off of what we learned. So very often a product is the result of having tried some other product before, which is the result of having tried another product before that. And if you search Wikipedia or, or rely on your own memory, you would know that the iPod was a success, the iPod Touch too, and that led to creating the iPhone, which you might have heard of. I mean, this is now an iPhone, iPhone, iPhone 35, is it? <laughs> it's this slab thing that, well, it's basically like this, but it costs about $3,000 more. 
So the iPhone was possible because of what Apple learned and it, all the machines and everything like that that they had to create to produce the iPod Touch. The iPhone was a success because people really wanted it. The iPhone and the experiences from producing the iPhone made the iPad possible. And of course, so on and so forth, right? Because there are more generations. And it's, it's, a, it's an evolutionary process in retrospect with revolutionary, revolutionary with an R, uh, innovations that cause the process, right? So this has an effect too on how we study regulations, right? Because if we ban a certain action at some point, we're not going to get this process. We're not going to get this cumulative process. It's going to end, right? Okay? So the unfolding of the market, the whole production structure is going to change. Okay, so let's look at the implications of CDC's banning of, of the touch screen. Okay? So of course, no one can continue to uh, innovate using touch screens. Whatever kinds of product they would produce using touch screens, no longer possible. The resources are instead directed to other types of production, not involving touch screens, right? The knowledge and the competencies, the types of jobs and everything like that involved in producing and developing touch screens and evolving touch screens into the sort of fantastic ones we have today, which are definitely better than what we had back in 2006, will also not happen. So the businesses doing this would also not happen, right? All those businesses created by pro to produce the materials used to produce touch screens, the factories used to produce the touch screens themselves, specific transportation, whatever there is, maybe a private university that would educate people in the art of touch screen production or whatever it is. Those things would never happen either, okay? And so forth. Right? All those businesses that would have been created to support these businesses that I just mentioned would also not happen. Okay, so this is what I call the unrealized because all of this did not happen. Okay, but it's not simply the seen or the unseen. It's not what happened versus what did not happen based off of one change. These are the long-term consequences, the implications of it, right? So this, how, how long does this continue? For how long will we have a distorted uh, production structure based off of regulation? Well, for as long as the regulation is there, right? And the economy will produce completely different things. But those different things will also have support organizations and innovations and entrepreneurs and new jobs and new types of education and so forth, right? To support those things, which are really malinvestments. They're overinvestments in things that consumers did not actually demand, right? Starting to see the picture? It's pretty nasty if you think about it, right? So structurally speaking, all it takes is one regulation that distorts production a little bit to force the whole economy, the production structure, to become out of whack with what consumers would want, or at least what entrepreneurs would expect consumers to want, right? So where entrepreneurs, if they were allowed to go wherever they wanted to satisfy consumers, they would have gone over here. But some regulation, just one, is all it takes, will cause some entrepreneurs to not go in that direction. They will instead choose something that is of a little lesser value or choose not to start a business at all, right? And the investment will happen there instead, which of course changes the structure. Because there's suddenly more demand for things over here, but they should have been over here had entrepreneurs been able to, uh, to pursue consumers' actual wants. Okay? Now, this causes a change to a lot of things that you might not even imagine, like different types of careers. Just one regulation means some careers are gone that are directly related to that regulation. In, in this case, say you're an a touch screen engineer. Of course, that job is not going to exist. But then anything else too, right? Anything else that has something to do with touch screens or the demand by companies producing touch screens. 
So maybe, maybe it is the case that touchscreen engineers, all of them really like banana van vanilla uh, coffee, whatever that is. But they're the only ones, say. So had uh, they been able to produce touchscreens, there would have been a business or a bunch of businesses producing this type of, of flavored coffee. Without the touchscreen, you would not have those jobs. You would have not have those companies. And coffee would instead go into some other type of production. Right? You can see now the extent of it. Right? It's not only that you, oh, you regulate a little bit here, and then the rest of it is intact. No, it's not, because it has ripple effects throughout the economy. Okay. So what this does, then, is that it sets the whole economy on a different trajectory. And the economy, in a sense, if you want to think about it as, as a process going somewhere, well, it's going in a different direction. It's no longer pursuing the value that consumers had at the very top of their lists, right? Instead, some regulation will change the direction a little bit one way or the other. And more regulations would change it even more. And of course, with each generation of investments, you would just increase this distortion because you would underinvest where consumers would have wanted it. And you would overinvest invest where consumers didn't actually want it. Not as much anyway. Right? For how long? Well, for as long as this regulation is effective, right? Because as long as this regulation bans someone from doing what is at the very top of their value scale, whether it's a producer or a consumer, that is lost. And instead, you get the distortion, OK? So I think now you're seeing the Austrian capital theory, economic calculation, Austrian entrepreneurship theory, how they all go together. You can't. You can't see the economy, you can't understand the economy without all of them, right? But now you're also see, you can also see how everything fits together and is, is distorted by just a tiny little change, right? Because it changes everything. Okay, so let's sum up a little bit. So in this economy, in, let's assume that there is an economy where, where there is Regulations. It's a, one of those suboptimal economies. Right? So the economic effect is, of course, that there's distortions. All processes are distorted in some way. Maybe they're just doing more or a little less than otherwise. Or maybe it's a new process. Or maybe that process would not exist. Right? That's different. We can also see that destruction is not really a big deal. Comparatively speaking, right? So bombing Dresden, destroying everybody's homes, that's going to change people's actions. It's going to change the magnitude in the statistics, right? And Krugman would wave a flag and say, wee, economic growth. Because everybody's uh, investing all this material in, in buildings. But it's at the very, high, the very top of their value scales, right? It's how they can satisfy their, their wants most. It's a temporary setback, but it doesn't change the economy. The economy is still structured to satisfy consumers to the greatest extent possible. OK? So bombing, no biggie. Rent control, holy crap. <laughs> That's basically what I'm saying, right? And you can see now why, right? Because the bombing is temporary, and then we can go back to our business and rebuild. Rent control, for as long as it affects rents, it's going to have a disastrous effect throughout the economy, probably. And also, as I usually claim, what this means is the libertarians, don't, they don't really understand how destructive regulations are. Right? Because if libertarians, especially people following the Chicago School, I mean, it doesn't matter how much you calculate in magnitudes using the statistics, how wrong the economy is or how much is lost in terms of prices. Because that has nothing to do with value still, right? Because val value can be really high and the price is still sort of low. So you can't capture the value. But even if you capture the prices, you don't capture this. You don't capture the distortion. You don't capture how the whole economy is out of whack. Okay. 
So even libertarians don't really understand how destructive regulations are. So how can we fight them? All right. So the book behind there is sort of where I elaborate on, on these views, well, these views, this theory on regulations and what that means. And there is the red one, the new one, which is uh, all of you got a free copy. Right? There's a short summary of it at the very end in the last chapter. So you should, of course, buy the, the expensive one. <laughs> All right, I, I'll stop right there, and I'll take some questions for a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I really enjoyed it. So my question is, what does the government get out of implementing destructive regulations? Destructive regulations as compared to what regulations? <laughs> so, I mean, they get con control, right? Um, they get to pretend like they are creating a better world, right? So they, there are plenty of, of gains for the political class, if you will, but for consumers, as long as we see the economy as a way of creating value for consumers, <clears throat> any regulation is necessarily uh, detrimental to consumers, right? And I'm assuming, of course, that there is private property and all this stuff, right? So that entrepreneurs can be real entrepreneurs and that entrepreneurs make money off of selling goods to consumers that consumers want. There's no fraud and things like that, right? So it's, it's a pure economic system. But politics is, is sort of the, the opposite of, of sound economics. Uh would you have a similar effect with subsidies? So instead of like cutting a, a value creation path off, they're instead incentivizing entrepreneurs to take one that, and the same way you said, isn't actually valued by consumers. Can I answer just yes? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's exactly the same thing, I would say. It's just the, the opposite, right? Instead of banning a certain action, you would, um, you would incentivize it by paying them extra, which is also a distortion of the whole incentive system throughout the economy. If I understood you correctly, you said that the negative effects of the regulation uh, go away once the regulation is removed. Uh, it, it seems, though, that the effects of it would still go on permanently. Because say you have the touchscreen ban in 2006, but I wanted the touchscreen iPod in 2006. Just because it's um, repealed in 2015 doesn't mean I want a touchscreen anymore. So it seems the negative effects would continue in perpetuity. The question is, do we continue distorting? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So. Yes, the distortion that has already happened is still there. And since the market process is cumulative, of course, it's going to linger. But we're not going to reinforce it if the regulation is gone or if people change their value scales so it's ineffective. Hi, I wanted to ask you if any of this logic applies to economic sanctions on the country imposing the sanction. So if this applies to sanctions? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. It, it affects anyone. Well, the country is a tricky one, but whoever is affected by the sanctions, yes. Right, because it, it affects not necessarily everyone directly, but it does affect, say, exporters in your country and importers in the other country or vice versa. And then whoever trades with them. So yes. Um, whoops. I was going to ask if. Um, we have a lot of regulations in the country right now. Uh, if you could choose, I mean, they're all bad, but if you could choose which regulations to get rid of first, let's say you, you, know, you got into power, which ones would you think need to go, go away uh, right away? Yeah, that, that does make sense. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I argue that any regulation will distort the economy and the production apparatus, right? So, so as long as you have regulations, it's going to be suboptimal a distorted economy. Of course, you still have the little issue here <clears throat> in a money economy where basically one side of each transaction is money. If you regulate and screw up money, you're going to screw up every transaction. So getting rid of, of government money and the central bank and, and bank, basically the banking system the way it looks, that would be a, a big step forward. 
right? But it's, it wouldn't solve everything, of course, but it would solve some things. All right. Uh, so your explanation works for government regulation, like national regulations of the economy. But what would happen if the regulations are imposed by other kind of institution, let's say yields or cartels or international standards organizations? Well, why would it be different? I mean, if, it's, if, it, is, if it is voluntarily adopted by users, then it's in line with their value scales. Right? But if it's imposed, it doesn't matter who imposes it, but if it's imposed on you, then you have those losses and those distortions. I mean, whether it's the mafia or if you call the mafia the government, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Firstly, I was skimming through your book yesterday, and I admired that your simplistic, uh, straightforward writing style. But my question is, is it possible that a uh, regulation could uh, incite a, an entrepreneur to um, allocate their resources to uh, invent a more demanded product. Yeah, of course. But the, the thing is, <clears throat> entrepreneurs invest under uncertainty, right? They are aiming for something that they expect consumers to value really highly. So of course it's possible that the government can subsidize a certain type of entrepreneurship and those entrepreneurs actually strike gold. It's possible. But why would you choose that method instead of letting entrepreneurs figure it out themselves? Because what you're doing is, is playing roulette, right? It's the chances, the odds of these entrepreneurs who the government has chosen to subsidize finding even more value than letting entrepreneurs do it themselves, those chances are really slim, I think. It's definitely possible, but systematically, no. My question was going back to the bombing sample. Um, it seems that- Of oh, the hypothetical about, city? Yeah, when you're talking about um, regulation and just talking about destruction as well, you're talking about how regulation has these uh, effects on other fields as well. But remembering the broken window fallac uh, fallacy, that's the same thing for the bombing of the city, theoretically. So why in that situation are destruction regulation different? It should be, in my, well, I think it would be the same, right? It is the same in the sense that, yes, you have these ripple effects, right? Like I mentioned, when, when you're rebuilding Dresden, you would have building materials reallocated from neighborhood cities, right? So you would have those changes. But the big difference, and what makes it a, a difference, is that these changes are to satisfy the most highly valued uh, want that remains unsatisfied, right? the buildings, the houses, the homes for those in Dresden. Whereas the regulation takes that option away from you. So you have, still have that want unsatisfied on your list, high up, but you can't pursue it. But in Dresden, you pursue the highest one. So uh, just to tease out more of the idea to get a more comprehensive overview, uh, one of a potential counter, not necessarily the strongest, could be can't entrepreneurs just try to bypass whatever the regulation is and still try to satisfy the same want? Sure, and they do all the time, right? Um, the issue there is that you have, you have artificially increased the cost for those entrepreneurs, right? So what that means is that they will need to figure out a way to satisfy consumers to an even greater extent to make their uh, ventures profitable. And if they were not, but they would have been the most profitable otherwise, well, then, then there's a loss still. Are we out of time? All right, thanks so much.